Okay, so in this video, I will try to answer your questions that you asked me on my YouTube community post. So let's start. So the first question comes from Murtaza Hassan and the question is that how to improve problem solving skills as an undergrad, how can one make sure whether it's lack of thinking or knowledge which is the obstacle? Okay, so first of all, I would say that in order to be good at problem solving, you need to practice as much as you can because there is no replacement for practice, right? So sometimes it can be both. Sometimes it can be a lack of thinking and sometimes it can be a lack of knowledge, but sometimes it can be both. And the thing is that in order to overcome the lack of knowledge, you just, you just need to read more and more and the lack of thinking thing can be you know covered by you know practicing more and more because when you practice you actually tend to develop mental connections that were not there before you practiced a particular kind of problem so i would say that practice more and more because i mean there is no replacement for practice Okay, so the next question is from Nachiket Kumar. Why photons have same velocity at every energy level and why photons and energy are not stable? And the third question is that how much dimensions required for the flow of energy? So I'm not sure that I got your question, but I'm going to answer according to what I understood. So the first question is that why photons have the same speed at every energy level? We have this, uh, you know, expectation that as the energy increases for a particular object, the speed of that energy should increase. Now, this particular expectation is actually coming from our classical experience. We do know that, you know, the momentum of any thing that's moving is related to the energy. And when the energy increases, the momentum increases. And when the momentum increases, the speed increases. Now, this particular expectation or this particular intuition actually does not go to the photons. For photons, it's very different. For photons, it's still true that as the momentum increases, the energy increases. That's still true. But the thing is that the speed of the photons is not directly related to the momentum itself, right? The momentum is proportional to energy. But the speed of the photon is not increasing as the momentum is increasing. In special relativity, any massless object should have the same speed, which is the speed of light, right? So since photons are massless, their speed should be the speed of light. But their energy still increases as their momentum increases. So if that answers your question, that'll be great. So the second question was why photons and energy are not stable. I really don't understand what you mean by that. But I can tell you that photons are very stable. There is no decay mode of photons. Why are which they decay very rapidly, right? So photons are pretty stable particles. I don't know what you mean by energy not being stable. So, you know, if you can elaborate on that question, that'll be great. So the last question was that how many dimensions are required for the flow of energy? So if I understood your question properly, my answer would be that you need at least two dimensions. You need a time dimension and a space dimension. Because if you don't have a time dimension, the word flow doesn't make a lot of sense. And if you don't have a space dimension, then again, the word flow doesn't make sense because flow means that something is going from one point in space to another point in space so you need at least one space dimension and at least one time dimension okay so the next question is from Bajpai Dewang in what chronological order I should learn mathematics to go till string theory I have finished mathematical methods by Arfkin Weber okay now how should I proceed and what resources should I use so first of all I would say that Arfkin Weber and Harris is very good for you know almost all undergrad level physics and it's also good from some graduate level physics as well so I would say that if you want to go to string theory you should learn quantum mechanics first and after quantum mechanics you should learn relativistic quantum mechanics that includes you know klein gordon equation and the properties of Dirac equation and after that I would say that you learn quantum field theory and after learning these two things so quantum mechanics and quantum field theory you should learn string theory and you can just start learning string theory because if you are very familiar with the techniques of quantum field theory most of the string theory methods will be familiar to you there are some places where you will require some mathematical uh, your results that are not taught in undergraduate level physics courses and those methods actually come from algebraic topology a good resource to study algebraic topology is Hatcher's book. Hatcher has a very good book on algebraic topology. If you want a lightweight book as compared to Hatcher, I would recommend Nakahara's book, Geometry, Topology and Physics. And I would say that Nakahara is for graduate level theoretical physics. What Arfkin, Weber and Harris is for undergraduate level physics to some extent. 
So the next question comes from physics lover. It says that I wanted to understand why Einstein equations are with rank 2 structure. A parallel argument in string perturbation theory, we expand the Lagrangian order by order with the inverse of strings coupling constant. The general theme in string field theory is to consider infinite order series to normalize the angular divergence by producers, by procedures, sorry, like analytic continuation and general theme of resurgence. So should we try considering higher derivative terms in the Einstein direction allowing for infinite derivative terms? The problem of ultra divergence results from assuming that the algebraic structure of quantum field theory is preserved at high energies, which we know is not completely true because we simply see that two point correlation function divergence in short distance. Okay, so if I understood your question properly, what you want to ask is that why Einstein field equations have a two derivative structure, right? Or a second derivative structure. In other words, you are also asking me that why don't we consider higher derivative terms? So for the people who don't know, Einstein field equations have a second derivative structure in the sense that you have a Ricci tensor and Ricci tensor contains the derivatives of Christoffel symbols and Christoffel symbols in turn contain the derivatives of matrix. So in other words, the Ricci tensor contains the second derivatives of the matrix tensor. Yes, it's true that Einstein field equations have a, a second derivative structure, but that's because it is the simplest equation which is consistent that you can write for general relativity like theory. But you can add higher derivative terms and it's not true to say that we don't consider higher derivative terms. We do consider higher derivative terms. Actually, there's a whole field that's called general relativity as an effective field theory. I would really encourage you to learn about the work of John Donahue. John Donahue is a theoretical physicist who did some remarkable work in the mid 90s and also in the last decade. And he considered general relativity as an effective field theory. And when you consider general relativity as an effective field theory, you can add higher derivative terms without you worrying too much about the renormalization of the theory. And in that particular approach, you can add higher derivative terms. In fact, there is a whole field that actually calculates the, the consequences of these higher derivative terms. For example, there was a paper by John Donahue and one of his collaborators in which they analyzed the predictions of uh, these effective field theories in the context of the early universe. And they thought that they could avoid Big Bang singularity. And it turns out that in a lot of situations, they can avoid the singularities. But if you include the whole standard model in the picture, then it turns out that probably you cannot avoid the singularity. So the next question comes from Mesochora. Okay, I hope I pronounced your name right. So the question is that, what's your opinion about Siegel's axioms of conformal field theories? So the, for the people who don't know, Siegel's axioms are actually an attempt to make conformal field theory mathematically rigorous for mathematicians to study. And it turns out that these axioms are quite successful. I mean, it turns out that CFTs are much more mathematically rigorous as compared to quantum field theories. For example, in quantum field theories, we use, you know, this object called the path in integral and there are arguments to show that these path integrals are simply not mathematically consistent but we still tend to get wonderful results from path integrals which is something to be cherished. But CFTs on the other hand are so mathematically rigorous that there are books on CFTs written for mathematicians. So the next question comes from Abhishek Singh. Uh, he asks that, can dark matter gravitationally collapse to form black holes? Well, since dark matter does interact gravitationally, I would say yes, there can be dark matter black holes, no doubt about that. One thing that I want to mention here is that if there is some unknown force that dark matter interacts with, such that this unknown force becomes activated at very, very, very small distances, then it can happen that it can counteract the gravitational collapse. But there may be some limit, like the Chandra Shaker limit in the usual case, where if the mass of the black hole is bigger than that limit, then this particular unknown force cannot avoid the gravitational collapse. So that thing I don't know. There may be, you know, some force that dark matter interacts with that we don't know about. So the next question is from Michael Convery. He asks that if a string wall sheet can be described with a 2D CFT, then is there some strange kind of 3D gravitational dual to that 2D CFT? Okay. Is there a topological mini ADS inside the loop of a closed string? So the thing is that you, you can have different 2D CFTs, you know, in, in the string theory case. Uh, for example, you can have the free boson CFT, right? Uh, that's one of the most studied CFTs in the context of string theory and also the free fermionic theories if you are talking about about the supersymmetric strings, but you can have different CFTs, two-dimensional CFTs, and there are three-dimensional gravitational duals work that are that have been worked out for 2D CFTs. For example, I would quote that there is a lot of work that has been done on the ADS3 and string theory on ADS3 by Matthias Gebardiel and his graduate student named uh, Lawrence Eberhard. So I would definitely recommend you to read their work, and I also recommend you to read the PhD thesis of Eberhard. Apart from that, I would say that there are other CFT 
NFTs, which include the Ising model and the different minimal models for which the gravitational duels have been proposed by Matthias Gabardiel and Rajesh Kopakumar and their collaborators. Coming back to the work of uh, Gabardiel and Eberhardt, their work includes finding the gravitational duel of a particular CFT called the symmetric orbifold CFT. So if you have that particular CFT, then it turns out that the gravitational duel is ADS3 cross S3 cross T4. ADS3 is just three-dimensional ADS. S3 is a three-dimensional sphere and T4 is a four-dimensional torus. So if you add the dimensions of these three spaces, you get 10, which should be the case because string theory lives in 10 dimensions, right? So this is one area where we understand a lot of things. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you want more videos like this, subscribe to this channel. Thank you.